Okay, cool. So I'm Pierre Ginter. I work for VSC Solutions. Luther is filming me, the bastard. Um, we're a technology company that specializes in vehicle logistics. So the biggest software um, problem that we solve in-house um, revolves around uh, fleet optimizations, making sure that your trucks drive the minimum amount of distance to service all of your orders and your customers. And then as well to make sure that the drivers actually follow the routes set out to them. So, um, so yeah, on the, on the one hand, you know, doesn't help if you you know plan all these savings and you don't actually get all these savings because some guy thinks he knows better than an algorithm and on the other hand um, there are some very real problems like fuel theft and you know people offloading things off, a, off the back of the truck so um, our execution monitoring you know revolves around a lot of that as well so introduction introduction and plug aside let's actually get into the topic okay so Database deployments can be some of the most nerve-wracking and quite often ulcer-inducing exercises, you know, <laughs> in development. Okay, if you cannot, um, if you, if you, if if you, uh, sorry, I'm Afrikaans, <laughs> my bad. Okay, if you cannot identify with that statement, then you are more than likely not going to learn anything new today. Okay. So, what makes this problem hard? Just let's look at those four points. First of all, um, you need to kind of figure out what you're comparing. So, for small applications, you're always going to be deploying your main line. But maybe you have this one client who, for whatever red tape reasons, is usually about three versions behind main line. So, you kind of need to figure out how his schema is different from the schema that you dev against day to day. Okay, so you're not deploying, you know, um, from the previous version. You might be deploying from two or three versions back, and because of his red tape, you're not deploying to your latest version. You may be deploying to two or three, ver like to two versions back from mainline. So figuring out which changes have been deployed to a given customer's data set, as well as which of the changes you've made to the database since that time, you know. It's, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, and once you've kind of figured out, okay, this version that's currently living on test is the one I'm trying to target, and that's you know currently what's on the client system, then you need to figure out what has changed between these two sets of schema. Now, schema div tools needs to get an honorable, honorable mention here. They are fantastic at tracking down changes, but Contrary to what the marketing tells you, they are very limited in solving those changes. Let's say you have a part table with a count column on it. Simple integer, um, not nullable, nothing fancy. In your next version of the schema, the count column is no longer there. There's a reserved count, there's an order count, and there's a total count. To which one of those three columns does count map? Is there some logic to breaking up the value in count based on other data in the system? that you need for that migration. Unless you know of a div tool that can actually beat requirements out of people, in which case I would like a linky, um, <laughs> you're going to need somebody that actually understands the system to make that call. So, um, yeah, just figuring out what's changed between the versions is a major headache. And then you get to a bit of SSDD, same schema, different deployment. Just because you migrated one customer successfully from version 1.1 to 1.2 doesn't mean that migration will work for the next customer. Because let's face it, if you're deploying a new change for the first time, you start with your low-hanging fruit. You start with a customer that uses the feature the least. You start with a customer that has the least likelihood of having funnies in the data. So just because it worked that once, not going to mean it's going to work the second time. So our fourth point actually doesn't involve production. It involves developers throttling each other. <laughs> because nothing sucks quite as much as working on a feature for three or four weeks and then you know, merging it with development to find out that the team next door just moved to the table that you were working around. Somebody from last year's conference offhandedly mentioned it's like kicking your foot into a coffee table in the middle of the night because somebody moved it. Okay, 
So what does successful database management look like? Now, I'm going to unashamedly steal from Paul Stobel's blog. Um, reason for this is that specific blog post was so well written that it formed the thinking behind DBUP, one of the other script runners that we'll get a mention later on. They actually enshrined it in their documentation. It was also my first exposure to this kind of work. So he really just sums it up really nicely. The first outcome is source control. He goes so far as to say that if your database isn't in source control, you don't deserve one. Go back to Excel. Um, so why the big deal? Why the big deal about source control? Um, source control, first of all, makes it easy to swap changes between people. It also gives you a canonical history of how those scripts changed over time. And most importantly, it allows you to tag certain changes with version numbers. When I, when I know that that client is on version 1.2, I can go to source control onto my master or my mainline branch and check out the scripts for 1.2. I can run that against the database and I know the schema I've got there is exactly what's running for that client. When I need to upgrade them to version 1.4, I check out the scripts for version 1.4. I don't um and ah about it. I don't go digging through my environment trying to find the test server for 1.4. I don't go screaming at some junior who thought it would be a good idea to do testing and his own development against that server, subtly changing the schema, causing the migration to break. The second one is your source control, by extension then, also allows your schema scripts to be testable. So whenever somebody makes a new schema script and test, puts it into source control, you can check that out. You can grab a copy of a client's backed up data. I, I hope you guys are backing up your client's data. And you can run that migration against that data and get, you know, first of all, an answer back whether or not the migration works, whether there's funnies in the data that's stopping you. Second one is you can run an old battery of integration tests to make sure that the thing is still whole, hail and uncorrupted afterwards. Then, Third point, continuous integration. Now that you've got a place to get your scripts from and that you've got a whole bunch of tests, hook it up to your CI system. Run those tests on every check-in. You know, shorten that loop before you find out that somebody moved the coffee table. Um, and then, obviously, the fourth one. It really sucks developing against a database where somebody is also making changes. Get each developer his own database. Make it trivial to spin that thing up from nothingness. Ensure that they can have their own separate sets of test data and that they can take ownership of that and craft their own things without affecting someone else. And that they can then exchange that data with someone else should the need arise. If the guy's dog sick or, you know, his cat ran somebody over with a car then, and he has to see to it, then he can pretty much just push those changes, somebody can check it out and actually keep on working. And then the last one is probably one of the most important and understated things. Dog fooding your own upgrades. For those of you who don't know the term, it's the shorter version of eating your own dog food. It means that the script that's good enough for your production deployment should be good enough for your day-to-day -day development deployments. So when, you know, PT uses a script to uh, migrate his database with his test changes, or test data, sorry, um, and he checks that thing in, then Tom next door should be able to use that same script to update his dev database with his test data. And that thing has to work. Because what Tom is deving exists in prod. And what PT is deving exists in prod. And it has to work across every single developer station. Yes, there's initial friction when, you know, you're not really into this whole schema migration script writing story and you kind of break everyone's stuff and everyone's angry at you so you don't want to do it. But once you get into it, once you kind of learn the lessons of what makes a good migration script, if you do it right, you will never ever hear complaints from anyone. Um, and that will directly translate into more stable deployments to QA, more stable deployments to pre-prod. And by the time you hit prod, any given migration has already succeeded, succeeded eight or nine times just from developers running it alone, let alone integration testing. So, I'm going to suggest a very small, you know, solution to try and hit some of those outcomes. And this is our toolbox. The first one is source control. You need some kind of source control. Get subversion, Mercurial, Team Foundation Server. I'm sorry if you're on that. Um, 
pretty much anything that will give you a central place where you can exchange um, where you can exchange data between developers um, that will integrate with your CI environment and that isn't a folder called backup one backup two okay the, the source control you use isn't really much of a focus as long as you have got a decent one going somewhere the second one is you need to change script runner I'm going to be focusing on Flyway. It's the cross-platform one of the two uh, mentioned here. DBUP is the one I grew up with. It's the one I used. It's catered for the .NET environment. Flyway, on the other hand, is more cross-platform. It works better with .NET Core on Linux, and it's Java compatible. So both of these can actually integrate directly into your application. So when you deploy your new binary, that application can go and upgrade its own backing database. Um, but you can also use it on a much more complex system where your database is a standalone thing all its own with multiple services connecting to it and you can then deploy and upgrade version changes to it using these tools as well in complete absence of an application driving that process. And our third tool is our change scripts. The very things that got us into this problem is what's going to dig us out of it. So every single change you make to that database, you're going to put in a script from now on. If you need to add a prefix to data in a column, you script it. If you drop a column, you script it. If you rename a column, you script it. If you create a database, you're probably not going to script that because it's really hard to run. Um, so there's a little bit of handy work to do still. But every change you make to a DB goes into a migration repository somewhere. And then the fourth one is the team of developers who's going to have to work together to make this work. If your team is the Wild West, where the only reason that your devs are using the same language is because that was a hiring requirement, this will not work. Okay? <laughs> you need to be able to work together. You need to be able to set aside ego and subscribe to a consistent shared standard. If not, these migration scripts are going to break around every corner. You need to be able to work together. You need to be able to communicate. Okay. So... I'm going to break open Flyway a little bit. The, at the core of Flyway, the very thing that makes it work is the schema history table. So when you give Flyway a whole bunch of scripts, it goes and checks your database for the existence of this table. In that table, you will find the version number for a given script, its name, when it was run, who ran it, how long it ran, as well as an MD5 checksum of the content of that script. Okay, this means that if you have 500 scripts and you run against them against a database that has the first 300 scripts already, it will do the MD5 checksum of the scripts, compare it to the entry, see that they are exactly the same, and skip it. It will then run over the first 300 scripts, not applying them, because the changes are already in the database. And then only from 301 through 500, it will apply. Okay. If Flyway detects that the content of a script has changed, if those MD5s do not match, if you accidentally added a space somewhere, it will freak out. It will tell you that there is no more guarantee that the state described by this list of scripts is actually going to be the state that you have in your database. If, for some silly reason, <laughs> you accidentally rename a file and that version number changes, or you added a version number or a version script retroactively, and it's not in that list, it's going to complain because the state defined by the script you gave it is potentially not the same as what it's currently got. Okay? And there are tools and ways to get around these things. But these are the safeties and the validations that these script runners bring to the game. So the first command that Flyway gives us is the migrate. It takes the scripts, compares it against the table, and runs the scripts against the database. Fairly self-explanatory. The second one is a command that must never ever reach production. As the name suggests, it cleans the DB. It wrecks all the schema. It dumps everything out so that you can run from clean again. So, never in production, ever. Okay. The third one is for systems that already exist in production but might not be as part of a schema migration thing you know, currently. If any of you are starting off new, you're going to be using baseline a lot. So what you're going to want to do for a brand new existing database is just take a dump of all the schema that makes it up. 
okay? Just do a PG dump schema or, you know, use any kind, any IDE like dbeaver or something, you know, that you're, that you like to use and just dump all the schema into a file and call it, you know, base schema. Check that into your source control and note the version number of that file. That file now perfectly describes the current state of that database. So you tell Flyway, I want to baseline this unversioned database on this script's name. So you're entering into a, an agreement with Flyway that in this list of schema history, this DB already exists at this point. Okay? Thus allowing you to bring a database that's already in production up to date with an existing set of scripts without having to try and run those scripts against the DB. So this baseline is for existing DBs or if you installed Postgres on a database. Because Postgres makes schema changes, Flyway picks that up and says, Oi, there's schema changes here, it's not empty, I can't run. So you have to tell Flyway, chill, <laughs> it's okay. This is version zero, you can just keep running on top of it, okay? But, so baseline, you know, clears out a few edges and burrs for existing schema. Um, then we get to the real magic, the V scripts. So Flyway dictates a naming convention, which is V, followed by a version number of some sort, a double underscore, and then a description, dot SQL. Okay? The dot SQL part is important. I've torn my hair out many times wondering why the hell does the script file not run? Because the extension is dot text. It's not a SQL file. Flyway won't recognize it. Dot SQL. So the important thing here is that version number after the V has to increment over time. So you can start with, you know, four zeros and a one. Next one is four zeros and a two, four zeros and a three. That's fine. It gets really, really crummy when two people working on separate branches made the same version numbers and you have to go and rename a whole bunch of files to make it fit. What we prefer to use is today's date, dot, and then a small sequence number. So that helps a lot because most people or one team might have been working on um, a whole bunch of changes, say from the first to the third, the second team was working from the second to the fourth, and then it's much easier to overlap and interleave their changes without, without having to go and fiddle with a whole bunch of version numbers on file names. Um, a vscript can only be run once. If a vscript's content changes, Flyway freaks out. If a vscript is inserted historically into an order and the script around it was already run against the DB, Flyway will freak out. Um, because it's all about making sure that your state is trustable in some form or fashion. R scripts are different. R scripts are repeatable scripts. They're not versioning scripts, they're repeatable scripts. So with an R script, it will only run if the script was never run before or if the MD5 checksum of the script changed. This makes it really nice for sample data. So if your sample data is updated, you can make an R script that will clean out your DB and just repopulate all the sample data. Um, referential data is also pretty, uh, pretty good use for this one. So if you have a table of provinces, that, that doesn't really change. Or if you have um, you know, a table of fixed customer types, then you can fill those out with R scripts. If they do change, you update the R script so that it, when it runs again, it will go and add the extra files using an insert on conflict update maybe. Um, and I just want to make sure that I've got the time right. Yeah, actually doing pretty well. So I'm going to take us into a couple of practical examples just so that you can see what it actually looks like in your DB after these after flyways actually run in modified files. So the first one is creating the database. I'll also explain why creating a DB with Flyway is a bit iffy. Um, then we're going to just add a simple table. We're going to set up some reference or test data for it. We're going to look at how Flyway behaves when you try and change the order of operations um, as well as changing the content of the script. Okay. Uh, okay, hold up a second. Please work, please work, please work. It didn't work. Um, give me a moment. They did show me how to fix this. <laughs> Covereth the multitude of sins. 
Okay. Oops, not there. There we go. Dus vier of vijf niet dan wordt gemaakt. Het probleem is als ik nou weer schakel naar 50 hertz toe, dan wil hem niet applaan. Want ik moet uitmaken, yes. Go freaking figure. Um, en zo rijdt, moet maken applaan. Ja, ja, het zal fijn zijn. Oké, so apparently trying to duplicate my screen is a mortal sin. Um, Come on. Needs to be able to see what you're doing anyway. Oh, right, I can see it down here. Awesome. Okay, cool. Mm, let's just open that. I'm going to need that. Okay, so. I've prepared a couple of folders with a couple of scripts, and I actually just need to make sure that Postgres is actually running on this machine, because I do switch it off sometimes. Okay, cool, it's running. Right, so I've got three table, three, four, I've got four directories there. The run directory is where I'm going to be copy, copying the scripts that I want to run. Um, you can point Flyway at a directory to tell it run all the scripts in here. So I'll be using that as my staging directory for running my scripts. I put all of my other scripts just in subfolders to make it easier for me to manage. So let's start with the first one. In the data folder, I've got a script called, oh no man, there we go, that one. Create database. Okay, fairly simple enough. I'm just going to make a database called Create Examples. So when I run that, um, okay, so there's my Flyway. The first thing I need to give it is my username. I'm pretty lazy, so I'm just going to use the Postgre user. Give it my password. There are other ways of securing your passwords. So it doesn't appear on the command line. Once again, examples, lazy and then my super secret password that I spelled totally correct, awesome. Okay, now I'm gonna give it a JDBC URL. I'm gonna be using the PostgreSQL driver against localhost, port 542, targeting the PostgreDB. In order to run Flyway, you have to target a database. So a lot of people, for security reasons, like hiding the Postgre database. So this is a bit of a chicken-egg scenario. You can't create a database unless a database exists. And this is why creating a DB with Flyway is slightly finicky. You need a starting point. You need something where you can create that schema history table so that it will run. Um, so for my purposes, I'm using the Postgre database. And then... I'm going to tell it to migrate. Uh, I can't tell it to migrate and I don't want to rub this thing out. So I'm going to add the locations. Um, as I said, this Flyway supports Java. So your locations can either be a folder on the file system or it can be a class path inside your Java application. So for locations, I'm just going to specify the run. It's file system and the run directory. <coughs> and then I'm gonna tell it to migrate and it's gonna do nothing because there's nothing in that directory. Okay, awesome source. So I'm going to go to the database, direc database directory and I'm gonna copy that file over to run and try this again. Right, now you can see it says it successfully 
validated the migration. Um, current version of schema on public is one. And I should probably try and scroll that up so everyone has an equal chance of reading it. Uh, why Windows? Why? Yeah, no, sorry. Okay, anyways, long story short, our thing ran successfully. So let's just open a, another window here. PSQL, user Postgre. Once again, my super secret password. And now, if I should be able to do a select star from, uh, let's fly away. Let's give my history. Oops. Yay, there we go. So there we can see the top line of the results is just the installed rank, the version of the script, the description of the script, its type, the actual name of the script, and then that weird negative number in the bottom corner is the MD5 checksum for the script. It was installed by the Postgre user. On that time, it ran 1,002 milliseconds, and it was successful. Okay, so now we can go back, and we can just clear out the run directory. Okay. Um, oops. Okay, let's just get back in here. Why did I exit? Okay, right, awesome. If I list all my databases, you can see there is, where is it? Why is it not there? Uh, did it not get created? Oh man, it was right. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's just see. Okay, examples does not exist. Okay. Oh, that's way too far. Huh. And like just like that, my complete computer went completely mad. Okay, let's just try that one again. Mm -hmm, that looks right. What on earth is it on about? Database examples does not exist. Sorry? Just list the create file. Let's see what it says inside. Um, yeah, no, that's that's actually all that's in there. It's create database <coughs> examples. Um, Ah, there we go. There we go. Well spotted. This was what happens when you use the examples you were going through last night before bed. There we go. Well spotted. Okay, no migration necessary. So it did run. Um, so why then can I not see examples in here? So that's the real mystery. Oh well. <laughs> like I said, creating DBs are finicky. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so just want to make sure that that run directory is okay. Right. RM. I really wish I was doing this on Linux. But my 
but my company won't let me install Linux on this laptop. Okay, um, so now we need to copy my first schema script over. That's the one. Okay. Boom. And that's the script. I'm just going to create a customer type table. It's got a serial column, it's got a code and a description. Nothing too fancy. Not that that reassurance has helped me much today so far. And this I'm going to run against the examples database. Successfully applied one migration to schema public. So over here, if I list it, there's my customer type table. Hooray! Okay, and my flyaway schema history table. So now I'm going to go back here and. Pierre. Yeah? 10 minutes remaining. Shot. Almost there. Um, okay, so let's actually just go over to the. Actually, no. If you guys go into Flyway's website, you can find a whole lot of similar examples that you can run through and play with it yourselves. So let's maybe use these last 10 minutes you know, for questions, if there are any. Anyone? Up front here. Uh, where's, the, where's the ice cream? There's the ice cream. Thank you. Um, in, in corporate environments, the, it's not always feasible to do a complete drop and tear down and bring up of the uh, in environment. So they often for deployments require um, rollback kind of scripts. So you must be able to apply and if the release fails in production, you must be able to roll back in this sort of okay. a, no, no. A, a back out of the whole. So how yeah. does Flyway deal with that kind of thing? Okay, Flyway does not support rollback in and of itself. However, Redgate bought Flyway and then they took um, all of their schema div tools and they made it so that you know the schema div tools generate the rollback scripts because unlike rolling forward rolling back is a very definitive thing you just need to restore what you had exactly and the schema div tool can do that very well so if you need rollback functionality on top of migration and you've got a really fat checkbook then you can go and buy the you know the very overpriced you know flyway kind of like pro edition on the other hand, you can always just take a backup before you run the script, like you should. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, but like I say, production environments oftentimes it's just. I've got a 200 gig database, a 200 gig database worth about, I uh, don't want to lie, but for about 400 million telematics points in it, and I've got point in time recovery for the last three weeks. It's doable. <laughs> It, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of backup space. I'm not going to lie, but it's doable. Okay. Anyone else? Is it possible if you say have a cluster of databases um, and your application where you sometimes have um, high availability as well? Is there a way to still achieve your high availability while? running these update scripts yes um, in that case you're actually going to have to lean on your IO availability quite a bit you're gonna have to take your first server down run your upgrades against it so basically down your server tell your whatever does your HA your PG bouncer or whatever that the server is now down no connection should go to it wait until the last queries are done running then you run the migration script on that server. You go and do your tests, you make sure that the migration was successful. If it was, then you do the cut over on your HA to that new server with the new schema, and you go and update the HA, and after that, just have them you know, exchange, you know, shake hands again, and you know, get your application back up and running. So yeah, it, it's actually easier to do this kind of thing with HA in place, because you don't have to bring this, the entire server down to run your migration. Anyone else? Um, tell me, have you guys maybe found uh, either with Flyway or some tools that's that's very nice to kind of create or generate your migration scripts? I'm okay. sure you, you might have, the question must have come up before. 
Yeah, I did mention it. The oh, DevTools. sorry. I'm the, the oh, DevTools. oh, oh. Yeah. Okay. Have you found a free non-fat checkbook way of doing it? <laughs> yeah. Pin, pin the responsibility on the bleep who caused the problem in the first place. <laughs> Have your dev shave and save its changes. <laughs> cool, thanks. Uh, you mentioned that changing schema is quite easy, but beating requirements out of people when you move data is hard. Mm. So, well, impossible. Um, so in a, in a simple example, let's say you have a field on a database, call it, or two fields, n um, name and surname, and you now move that into one combined field. Um, just simply changing the schema is easy, yeah. and we now intuitively know what has to happen to that data, but in complex cases, we don't know. How do you guys manage that, where you need to move lots of data and potentially r roll it back? So, so not just schema, but data as well. Carefully with great trepidation. Um, at some point, you know, somebody's making that change. Somebody knows what's going on. And that one person should be available you know, as part of, you know, this whole schema generation process to give guidance as to what should change, how and when. And throughout that entire process, you try and test this thing as much as possible against live backups if your environment allows it. And the simplest way to do a rollback for a complex migration is actually to restore a backup. You know, rollback scripts can fail as just as much as a, mic a forward migration script. A DB backup, however, will restore you to exactly what you were. So you back up, you work, oh sorry, you first work diligently and thoughtfully with the requirements next to you, then you make a backup, you run it, you test it as, test it as best you can, and if there's any hiccup, you restore that backup. And you go back to the drawing board and you account for the surprise you found in production. Um, okay, so we often have, we've got a lot of functions in the database, and we often either fix something in a running server where there is an error, one of those cases where something wasn't probably thought out, and or sometimes uh, we've got DBs coming from 1999 when it wasn't Postgres, um, all the way up until today it is a... Um, um, I don't want to say shit show, but it is effectively a shit show. Um, talking about a couple of thousand DBs, some of them on local machines, and we often find that when you go to apply that thing, it's either already applied or maybe that whole yeah. set of schema doesn't exist. Do you have that and how do you deal with it? Our system is way too young. We have a Greenfields project. Okay, so I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting there. Um, we are inheriting some things, you know, um, like uh, other systems we need to integrate to. Um, but, yeah, the best thing I, the best, the best you can do in that situation is just try and make the best of it. If you find that the thing's already, you know, on there, just, functions are nice. Functions won't complain if you deploy the same function definition again. So, Flyway is not going to complain in that sense. Um, adding a column where the column already exists is a bit more iffy. Um, you need to, really guard and you know test and do do, do a bit of housekeeping before in that in your change script before you can actually apply the change so functions functions are okay just add the script to add the function or the fun or the version of the function you want and when it runs then you know it's at that version um, but for your guys yeah good luck just try and make the best of it <laughs> yeah um, we should be getting close to time I think yeah we're, we're there okay cool thanks a lot eh?